Yes, Alec Murdoch. 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 However you want to say it. That was a big thing when I first started covering this story was how do you even say this guy's name? Because you listen. It looks like Alex Murdoch. But then you go down to the low country, you listen to him, you listen to his friends. Everybody says it a little bit differently. And I just land on Alec Murdoch. I don't know. But why, why he really did it to me as we sit here today after what happened in court today is the final question, the final piece to this puzzle. It's the final piece to the puzzle. And I think we can take everything that we have learned, everything we've heard from him, from investigators, emails, actions, everything he did. And I think we can figure that out now, like why he really did it. Because a couple of things have just happened recently that I think puts a little more light on all of this. And you start with like who this guy is. Like who is he? Who is Alec Murdoch? Who is he? This guy had a great business. It's a great business model as well. I mean, for his family for years, which was personal injury with a specialty in suing railroads around the country. But they would sue them in their area of South Carolina, home court advantage every time. But they learned the tricks they, through the years. A uh, very sophisticated operation in terms of personal injury and made a lot of money. Now, I was down there, right? Like if you have Alec Murdoch type of money and you live down there, you are king beyond king. I mean, you could live well anywhere. You could live well anywhere with that kind of money. But down there, like, he was the king of the king. And he lived that way. And he lived large. And I, and from studying, like, him, his family's history and everything else, you, you saw how the family had built something that had a level of prestige. Um, the other thing about the family, and, and, and it ended with his father, like, they were the prosecutors down there. They called them solicitors or solicitor generals in, in that part of of South Carolina, which meant that they controlled who got prosecuted. So they had all these connections, but that's not where they made their money. You see, there's no money in prosecuting people. There is power in prosecuting people. Power, not money. The money comes from the civil courtrooms, which they also controlled as this uh, very powerful personal injury firm. Now, personal injury, this is the type of practice, plaintiff's work, they call it. These are the people that file suits on behalf of members of the public. And, and you've seen, these are these are the lawyers who, who not all of them do it, but the, the lawyers that put commercials on television and have the billboards, um, 99 times out of 100, they are personal injury plaintiff's attorneys, attorneys who sue companies, corporations, insurance companies, on behalf of people who've been who've been damaged. And there's there's a couple of keys to this whole thing, to having this practice and this lifestyle of being a very successful plaintiff's attorney. First, you have to have access to clients. Like people have to walk through your door and say, I want to hire you. Because you, you make money from the volume of cases you have, right? If you have, you know, a thousand small cases and then you have one or two big ones. You try to get one every year. Sometimes you don't get one every year. Sometimes you get two or three in the same year. But because of the volume that you deal with and you have a good reputation of getting money for people, word spreads. So when someone has that big case, they go to the guy who does all the little cases too. And you build up a, a, a tremendous practice. And there's a connection between the 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 power of the criminal courts as the prosecutor and and making all this money and and as i as i look at that relationship and the way it played out for this family for years and then ultimately for alec murdoch i think i understand why he really did it he wasn't he wasn't at the same level of power and influence as his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were. Now, I don't know if it's it's because he liked to party. 
I don't know if it was, whatever it was, he was not the solicitor. He worked in the solicitor's office locally, um, but that wasn't part of what he did. He was all in on the civil practice. He didn't do both of them to try to like um, have the power and and the influence at the same time. But his his father had stayed in that office for a long, long time. So it was almost as if he'd sort of timed out of it, that he got so old, so entrenched in making money um, that he did not become the, the prosecutor. And this case would have been much more complicated if he was the local solicitor general at the time, that all this is happening. Wow. You talk about corruption beyond corruption at that point. But he still walked around with that swagger, that same sort of swagger and entitlement where he felt like, I'm a Murdoch, I can control everything that happens. And ultimately, it does all come back to the boat case and, and the boat crash case. That is That is really, if that doesn't happen, I don't think the murders happen either. I don't even know if he gets caught cheating all his clients and cheating his law partners. I don't know if any of that is revealed to the extent that it was or unraveled the way it did if that boat crash case didn't happen. Because that put the, and I think the prosecutor was, was right here, that it put the pressure on Alec Murdoch. Now, but the other part of this is the, the so-called um, opioid addiction, right? So you have a guy allegedly on drugs. It seems like he did have some issues because it seemed other people kind of knew about it, but it became a much bigger deal after all the trouble he got into with the financial crimes and obviously what he did to his wife and his son. Now, he was in court today. In the, in the federal case, and 40 years is what he got. 40 years in the federal system, you do 85%. So, you know, 30 years or so is where he's at because he has some, um, probably has some credit for time served already because it's a concurrent sentence to his state federal crimes. But Part of his deal was he had to tell the truth and they gave him a lie detector test. And it was, and, and the examiner said he was not being truthful. And these were questions about finances, other crimes and, and the money. And that's always been a problem for me. It's like, where did all of this money go was, and we were waiting, you know, was there, was there, another part of the story that was going to reveal itself. Now, some people have looked at this case and said, there's no way he did it. Somebody else did it and made it look like he did it. And that's connected to all the money and, you know, whether it's some sort of uh, drug syndicate or problems he got into. I'm not buying any of that based upon the evidence that I saw and heard inside the courtroom. I'm not buying that. I'm not going down there. But I do think, I do think that, it's, it's impossible that the amount of money that he stole from so many people for so many years were just to buy little pills. I can't believe that. So that leads me to, there's, there's I think, and, and what I believe is that there's another slice of this man and his life and lifestyle that we didn't, see in court or hear about and no one testified about it. And I think that's connected to where all the money went. And I think that's ultimately connected to the ultimate question of why he really did all of this. I think there, were, there, was, there was more happening. And you know, when you're down there, you hear whispers about lifestyle, about you know who this guy was. Was he a family guy? Was he not a family guy? Um, you know, wh where was he going? Who was he doing these things with? Who was he associating with? And I think what happened here, it's, it's just a combination of things are going on. Like throughout his life, he feels a sense of entitlement and, and being in a bubble where I can control situations and do things 
and not suffer any negative impact as a result. And that's kind of ingrained in you. Like that, all right, I can I can do whatever I want. And I think that's what gives him the ability to, in his mind, come to these conclusions that there is some way out of every, the hole that he dug for himself um, that was uncovered. Right? So the, the, the boat crash was a problem because civil liability, the suits... This was a very aggressive lawsuit. The liability seemed to be very, very clear that his son was responsible and they were plying him with alcohol and, you know, a lot of problems, which would have put him on the hook. So they were going after Alec Murdoch for money, for real. And they wanted access to all this information. We heard about this during the trial. And the prosecutor talked about it. It was a big part of his... Um, motive that he argued to the jury. But think about it for a second, though. Think about, so you start in a position where you are untouchable. You are bigger than big. You are powerful. You have influence. And nothing, you know, through your life, whether growing up as a young man, young lawyer, um, whatever you're engaged in and you do something that's a little bit, you know, not exactly what you should be doing, nothing ever happens to you. So there's a feeling, I think, a sense that all of a sudden he can get away with anything and can just get away with it. So he had this, this confidence not, I don't think it's based in reality, but it was based on his reality that he had lived. Up until this point, he had lived a reality where he, he could do whatever he wanted to do and live big and gregariously. And people, whether they feared him, respected him, or knew that he could um, do things, I mean, that's that was part of, that was in his DNA. So now when things go south, all of this is a reaction to that. Like, okay, things are going south. Well, what am I going to do? First with the boat crash, that night, him and his father are down at the hospital. They're trying to straighten things out and get stories straight, but mm, it's not working. It's not working. And it's not going to work in this case because you're talking about um, this girl who lost her life, these young people whose lives were shattered, there's video you can see. The witnesses knew what they saw. So there wasn't going to be a way to kind of like, you know, mold this situation into my son is not the cause of all of this. It wasn't going to happen. Like he tried that. And that's like the first, that's the first, um, probably one of the first times I would think in his life. And this is, and there's a lot at stake here. There's a lot of money at stake here. And this is a problem. Civil cases are about liability and damages, liability and damages. So the liability is, is, is his son, Paul, responsible for the boat crash. And he thought he can control that. He couldn't control that. It was clear that he's not going to win that. And he could say that he was going to win it, but he knew he knew he wasn't going to win that. He was a civil attorney. He he knows the way people are going to see that. So you, you, you start seeing someone now who is like, oh, I don't have 100% control of this. Then you get to the liability aspect of the boat crash, which is, you know, they want to see his financials. How much money do you have? Because civil attorneys, when they're when they're going after someone and a family and a man, and, and eventually assets, they want to make sure that the person who's on the on, on the hook or potentially on the hook is not taking money, moving it around and hiding it. So if you win your case, all of a sudden there's no money left. So you take care of that ahead of time. And that was happening. And Creighton Waters told us about that and, and, and use that. So... That was extreme pressure. And, and as that's happening, 
he's feeling it. He's feeling it. And all of a sudden, the man with all the bravado, the man in control, the man with a plan, whatever you want to call him, realizes that, eh, we're going to take a hit here. This is like a real hit. And that takes us to step two, which is all this money he's been stealing for years. At the time of the boat crash, he had already been committing felonies for years by ripping off clients. But, but now the problem is, as there is an examination of his finances and his financial uh, wherewithal in all of this, now you've got the problem of someone's going to be taking a closer look at my finances. You know, for years I've been able to, you know, blah, 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 kind of just blow it over and, you know, rob from Peter to pay Paul, move money around, borrow from here, put it here. And in the end, it's all adds up because of people don't fear you. I mean, people fear you, people respect you and friends that he had uh, trusted him, his partners um, felt indebted to the family because they were having a, a, a great lives, you know, working in that firm. So there was that, all of that, but that was going to, that, that was going to disappear. Now let's get back to all the money because now we take it to, to something else that was revealed in this latest hearing, which was he was supposed to be truthful to, to the feds, failed the lie detector test. And, and the real takeaway from that for me was there's more to the story. There's more to the story. It's not him just buying a bunch of pills. How could anyone buy that many pills, take that many pills, and still be alive? Impossible. Do the math. It's impossible. So there was something else funny going on with the money, and I don't think we know what that is. And I don't think he can say what that is. And he's going to hold that here. And he's not going to give that up because I don't know who it imp implicates. Does it implicate someone else in his family? Does it implicate uh, someone who could do, do harm to him or his son, Buster, if he even cares about Buster anymore? Um, so there, there's more to this, this life. And, and, I, and I don't know if this money is buried, is shared with someone else who he was kind of in business with that knew about this. But that's something that is still, to this day, is hidden. And I believe that failed polygraph revealed that he's, he's got more to say that he's not saying and will never say, just like he'll never admit doing what he did. He'll admit to all the financial ripping off of clients because then he says, I'm sorry, I'm, I apologize. I want to meet you in person to apologize in person. He puts on his... his, his, his um, his faux Southern charm that he tries to use and has used for years in front of juries and in front of clients and judges and, and partners and everything else. He, he knows how to play that game. I don't know if anyone's buying it anymore, but he thinks he can still sell it. He tried to sell it on the witness stand. Didn't work. So, and I'm, and I'm looking at a lot of these uh, comments as they're flying by. Uh, the cousin Eddie, there, there, come on, there's more there. Don't tell me there's not more there. There is. There's, there's more there. I don't know what it is, but there's more there. There's no doubt in my mind that there's more to cousin Eddie that we don't know. More to cousin Eddie that we just don't know. But to me, that's, that's the other piece, right? There's more to this story, something that he's hiding and what he's hiding um, is part of the reason why he wanted to take such drastic steps to try to protect everything from being unraveled. And, and again, I think Creighton Waters was on target here, like with, with the fact that when he was confronted at work by the accountant, the CEO, whoever it is, the, the financial person at his office, who came across these discrepancies and didn't understand where the money was. Like we all know where the money went, it went into his pocket and he shared it with somebody else. Um, but all of that unraveling, then, then he's going to lose the law firm. 
and he knows that he's going to lose the law firm. That's bad. That's bad. Because now, now you're, you're a Murdoch and you're not a lawyer. You're a Murdoch without a law firm. And he's, and he's desperately trying to think of a way out of all of this. And two things, like his son, Paul. In his mind, this is this is this is the reason everything's unraveling. It's because of him. It's because of him. He's the one that caused that boat crash that that started all of this. So that's why I feel like, again, in this warped mind of his, like, listen. I can, I can, I've got to get out of this. Number one, I can't have everything revealed. Number two, I need a way out. I need a way out. How do I get out? Someone's after me. Someone's after me and my family. That's the setup. You, you take yourself from being someone who's a scammer and a schemer to a victim and a target, right? A victim and a target. That's the play he's making in his head. And I, I don't know where that comes from. Like, how, how do you make that leap? Because it's so extreme, so, so extreme. But when you've got a part of your life that that to this day is still secret, that we don't know about, that you're hiding and protecting, you're going to do whatever you can, whatever you can. It's, it's, it's a distraction, yes, but it's more than that. Paul is gone. Maybe that helps me a little bit with this boat crash situation. Oh, my wife is gone too. I'm a victim. They were probably looking for me. And that's that, and that's the leads you to the roadside uh shooting, that whole fake setup with cousin Eddie on the side of the road. That's to continue this, this story, this narrative that he's trying to create that someone's out there to get me, get us, get the Murdochs. Obviously, it didn't work. It didn't make sense, and it wasn't executed very well. And the timeline and everything else that he didn't know about at the time, like the phone recording, et cetera. I mean, it's all gone. But brings me to my conclusion that this is a guy who's, who's used to doing what he wants, and nothing happens to me. But then when something started to happen to me, he still felt like, well, I can still fix this. I can still control this because of who I am. It was desperate. It was extreme. It bought him a little bit of time. I don't, I'm not buying that it was he was strung out on some addiction. No, there's 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 something else because that money is somewhere else, and that's the untold part of the story. And he's taken it to his grave, and he's taken it to the prison. He's going to die in prison. Like even if this, um, the conviction for the trial that we all watched gets overturned, that life conviction, and he gets a new trial and something happens there. Just on the financial crimes, the federal crimes, 40 years today, 40 years, 85% of that puts him in his 80s. How many people like 81, 82, 83, 84 years old do you see walking out of a, out of a, out of a jail, out of a prison? It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. He has more, more. And all that money, like, like I think some of it's buried, but I think some of it went into this lifestyle that is has not revealed itself anywhere. 
right? Might be whispers, but like, come on, come on. All this money and the drugs and Cousin Eddie and stealing and scheming and he goes home and he's a happy family guy. Does that make sense? Does that make any sense to you? That that part of his life would be very normal, but everything else is completely out of whack? No, no, no. There's like this private secret life that we have not seen. And that's the fabric of where it comes from, why he's able, why he did what he did. Because there's a darkness, there's a darkness that we haven't even seen. And a like, don't play this family guy game to me. I'm not buying it because it's it's a complete contrast to everything else in your life. Every friendship, every uh, partner, every client. I mean, all of it, it was all fake. You were putting on a show for everybody. You don't think you're putting on a show for your family too? He may have cared about his mom and dad. I don't know about his own family there. Like, how can you get to the point that you could do that? You get to that point because that whole picture was not real. That was not that was not a true snapshot of who this guy was. It wasn't family guy. It wasn't family guy. There was something else going on. Absolutely. Nobody's going through that much money. That much money. And then just do do do. Let me put on my Vinnie Vine shirt going home. Want me to mow the lawn today? Come on. So anyhow, I think that's just the tip of the iceberg, ATS news in the house, tip of the iceberg, tip of the iceberg. Um, there's a whole super secret thing that we're just not going to learn about because the other people involved, they're not going to say anything. You think they're going to say something about it? No way. No way. A lot of corruption. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. If you have one person or one family in charge of an office for that many years, that's problematic. It's prob power, power, um, too much power for too long. I mean, th this is possible. This is possible. Although, wouldn't you admit that? I think you could admit that. I think there's the, the, the problem goes beyond that. And it's something you can't admit because a, a family guy can still, if you're going to be addicted to things, you could be addicted to gambling, you could be addicted to growth. And he may have had a problem with this as well. But I don't think that's the secret. All right, Mete from Norway, smash the like button. Yeah, we need we need we need to hit the like button a little bit. We need a little bit of sharing, a lot of sharing on the Facebook. Yeah, uh, I, th I think there's a lot of that. I think there's a lot of that, Cynthia. I think there's a lot of that. Vinnie Vines. <laughs> so they call they call. It's the first time I've ever heard of a Vinnie Vine shirt. I always thought it was Vineyard Vines, but everyone down there calling it Vinnie Vines. So I was thinking about getting one, but I really, I don't like them. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate it. <laughs> now, like, I, 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 you know, I don't know what the dynamics were here. Like the kids clearly were entitled. We saw we saw that play out. I mean, that was we saw that from videos, documentaries, uh, people who talked about them, the, the way they held themselves out there. Absolutely. I think it was a Paul much more so than Buster. I think Buster, um, I don't I don't know what Buster's deal is. 
But I think he, he was much less so than Paul. Paul was the one that was a little bit out of control. Um, what was that money was blown? On what, though? On what? On what? On what? Thank you, Lisa Love. If Eddie has the information, right? And I don't, I don't know. Would you, would you let a guy like Eddie into that level of secret? Maybe, maybe not. But if that still exists, if if Alec can't reveal it, why would Eddie reveal it? Whatever this was, however deep it went, right? I like give Alec isn't going to do it. Is this a guy who has nothing to lose? Perhaps. Like if 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 he can't reveal it with his expensive lawyers and everything else, I don't think Eddie could either. But um. I think Eddie will be – I don't think he's in that much trouble. I don't think he's that worried about how much trouble he's in. <laughs> uh, he's He is a deplorable person for sure, for sure. See, the, the other thing is about the – what happened to Maggie and Paul, like – like, like it was brutal. The crime scene is brutal. Like, like, like Maggie's run, running away, like, like an animal trying to escape from a predator. That's what makes this sick. Oh, this is interesting, Crystal. And getting a fair trial and being guilty are two different things. Two, uh, two different. You can be guilty and not get a fair trial, and get another trial and be convicted again. Um, but there were some strange things with the uh, with Becky Hill, and, and I think, I think, some of those things that happened and transpired, while the judge who took over the case didn't think it was enough um, to overturn this conviction, it still has to go through two appellate levels in, in South Carolina, and then you can always attempt to have the United States Supreme Court hear it. Mm -mm. Hello, Faye. Yep. Evil. Um, thank you so much, Jukester. She jukes her. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt that. I wouldn't doubt that he's gambling in prison. And I do think yeah, gambling and drugs, is there less? Like, well, the thing with, with, with drugs, though, the thing with drugs, opioids, like, oh, I got hooked on prescriptions and then it just got out of control. Right. A lot of people, a lot of good people have suffered that addiction. So um, that's why I think it's it's very even these days with gambling. Right. The, the way some of these addictions happen. Um, and how they start. Right. Because we know of all the controversy with some of these medications that have been pushed uh, by pharma. Um, that is also a problem. Yes, please ring the bell. Ring the bell. Ring the bell. No, they didn't know. They, I, I mean, this was a surprise attack. There is no doubt. Yeah, a lot of trips. A lot of those little trips. A lot of trips. This would not surprise me. That wouldn't shock me. I don't know if it's an addiction or just what he wanted to do. But where does all that money go? Come on. Where does that money go? This is interesting. This is interesting. Will he write a book? 
what now there are laws that have been passed where you can't make money from your crimes but could you write a book that dances around it and and takes advantage of his infamy i could see that i i could see i mean he's got a long time long time exit 148 148 is that bloomfield is that bloomfield 148 is that bloomfield avenue am i remembering my exits correctly it's been like more than a decade <laughs> excess can cost millions from Sweden, living in Mexico. Mm. Great insight. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, this is very, very possible. Um, I would think that they're, they would try to track it down somehow, some way. If it's there or if it's buried in the hunting ground. I don't know. Here's from Martha. I, I could see it. I could absolutely see it. New Zealand in the house. His lawyers have, have been paid. They, they found money for the lawyers. They found money for the lawyers. Nobody likes the squeaky chair. Nobody likes the squeaky chair. Uh, Lisa says you got a fair trial. Well, all, most convicted people do, but when you're a little more sophisticated and you're a lawyer, you'll do uh, more than anything uh, to attempt to get out of it, get out from under it and get a second chance, a second trial, because uh, you know that's the only chance you have. That's too bad, wise angel. Um, yeah, you guys don't permit cameras in your courtroom. Neither does Canada. Um, so I've noticed through the years a lot of Canadian viewers, viewers from the UK, fascinated by watching uh, trials. Here in the United States, obviously, it's Court TV that really did it in a big way, uh, putting cameras inside the courtroom. Um, it's just a different way of looking at your system of justice. Like, courts are public. Yeah, there are protections for the accused, but there's also uh, the protections for the public. I mean, when someone is tried in a criminal case, it's not, you know, one person against another person. It's the people of that state, the people of that commonwealth um, who are really the ones who are accusing the defendant in that case. Yeah, he'll be there for a long, long, long time. I think he dies there. Uh, I'm just wondering how, how often uh, the stories will continue to come out about Murdoch. You know, will things happen behind bars? Um, Scott Peterson, you know, is one who, he kind of goes in waves. And I'll tell you what you're going to see probably in 10 years, could be less, but in 10 years when people... You know, memories start to fade a little bit about the details of the trial. Someone will make one of these mockumentaries showing us uh, all this new evidence that proves that Alec Murdoch did not do it. I can't wait to see that so I can criticize it. Yeah, we heard about the Tiger King. Um, we are, are tracking it. I'm not sure. I am not sure. If we're going to be um, on that, but everyone wants to see what the Tiger King's up to, right? Right. If you made it to a book, you can't make money on it, but there might be some loopholes in it. You're not supposed to profit from the crime itself, but what if he writes about something else? You know, I could, I could see that. Exit 154. Great to have you aboard. 5B, 5B on the turnpike, the Jersey Devil. So 5B, that's way, that's way down there. 
almost as far down. There's Claudia. Exit 74. Way down. We got a lot, a lot of Jersey folks in today. That's good to see. Um, okay. Martha. Everyone thought Grisham was in the courtroom, but it wasn't him. It was, actually met the guy. I think it was, it was someone. I can't remember who it was. It was somebody's parent. Somebody's father. Like it, it wasn't Grisham, but it was a Grisham lookalike who was in the courtroom. Although it's right in Grisham's sweet spot, this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, look at this. Is Murdoch as talented as the Norfolk DA? Throwing a little Karen Reed in here. <laughs> Tracy, but here's the thing. I don't I don't think um, people in that profession worry about the attraction. I think it's just the amount of money that they have. I think um, unless, you know, unless it's like pretty woman, right? That's that's a different scenario. Oh, look at this. Only on the judge. Gotcha for the sentencing. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, South Africa is good. Yeah, Crystal. Um, I knew that because we covered we covered one here in the United States, the big one involving the uh, Blade Runner, who just got out of prison, right? Or is supposed to get out? And I think he did. He did get out. All right. So, um, yes, great to see you, Sonia. Bella Italia just got home from work. Now she's got to make some lasagna, right? <laughs> All right. Tiger King? What's next for the Tiger King? Yeah, so Buster at the trial was really in, oh, what an awkward position he was in. He did testify, though. He was there every day. I don't know what his life is going to be like. He did, he did, I don't know if he passed the bar as his uh, fiance, girlfriend. Um, is a lawyer. But I don't know what the future holds for him. Maybe he'll work for his uncle. Let me tell you about Colorado. Colorado is on my naughty list right now. Now, when I was with Court TV the first time around, when Court TV, Court TV went off the air for just a few years. Tons of cases out of Colorado. Judges in Colorado were fair and open and, and permitted cameras and microphones. And we covered a lot of stuff out of Colorado. We relaunched in 2019, and all of a sudden, Colorado and their judges say no, 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 no. Uh, I tracked four or five really, really fascinating cases out of Colorado that went to trial, and we were denied every time. So I'm a, and I'm, you're going to have great cases, but you're not going to see great trials in Colorado. WV, great to see you, Jeannie. All right, so um, I've got to wrap up here shortly. Um, need to get to, um, where do I need to get to? Um, need to get to um, the studio. Tonight on the show, Doomsday Bells. You know the Doomsday Bells? Chad and Lori. Chad's trial started today. I'll be talking about uh, that case in upcoming um, uh, live streams here. Uh, but we've got live report from there, day one of jury selection. And we're going to be talking with someone really close to Chad Daybell. Really close to Chad Daybell. They were in the same prayer groups together. Knows him very well. And we're going to go through Chad Daybell's belief system, 
layer by layer. It's going to be fascinating. That's tonight at 8 o'clock. 9 o'clock, we're going to get into uh, what happened in the uh, Murdoch case today and what the future entails and, you know, how does how does this happen, right? How, do, how, does, a, how does a lawyer break this bad? Um, we'll be doing that tonight. Thank you for all the great comments. Um, always appreciated. Please um, hit the like button, ring the bells, share the videos. Um, and it's great to see everyone here on YouTube, Facebook, and also on X. Also on X. So, uh, and we also, we're also on um, Twitch, but I haven't seen any Twitch comments populate yet. We're building up that Twitch following. The Twitchers. Oh, look, Texas Gal also on X tonight. There you go. Yeah, a lot of comments today. Oh, here we go. I'll just finish this question. This is a good question coming out today. Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, always wondered why they perform lie detector tests if they're not admissible in court. And the two things I'm sure why was responsible for the young man, Stephen. Um, Stephen, no. Stephen, I believe, was a hit and run. Um, they have someone in mind. It's It does not appear that it's Murdoch related. The Murdochs apparently were there, though, trying to get the case um, for their civil law firm. Okay. So the reason, uh, this is what I believe, the, the reason the Murdochs were at the Stephen Smith accident scene and calling Stephen's mother so quickly is they were connected to law enforcement. They were connected to law enforcement. And what I say in the beginning of this whole thing, like civil lawyers make money from the volume of cases. Well, you've got to get cases. This, is a, this would have been a big case, a hit and run, uh, potential wrongful death case against whoever struck Stephen Smith. So if you're a civil lawyer, that's a big case for you. And they would get tips from people who were responding to um, car accidents. So they would show up at the scene as lawyers handing out their cards and, and finding out who they should contact in the case and getting information about the victim, victim's name, victim's address. That stuff's a little ethically shady. Um but I do believe that's why you had uh, the Murdochs connected to the Stephen Smith case like that night, which made them look very suspicious in light of everything else that's happened here. Um, lie detectors are not admissible because the, the science um, has not been accepted by our courts. But it can become admissible if both sides agree to it. If both sides agree, we'll put the results in. They'll come in. But the science has not been um, accepted by the courts. And there's like a certain uh, test of reliability for any type of science or alleged science uh, in these cases. But uh, again, thank you for all the great uh, uh, comments. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing. And um, again, 8 o'clock tonight, Court TV, 8 to 10. Um, we will be there. Um, Oh, what's this? Right. Always checking for breaking news, right? Every every second of the day, I got to check breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. Um, thank you for checking in. 8 o'clock tonight, 8 to 10 on Court TV. If you don't know where to find uh, Court TV, uh, you can go to courttv.com and they have a where to find Court TV tab there. You click it, you'll find out where, where Court TV is. So you can see the show tonight. And um, that's all I have now. That's all I have. I just want to get on about this Murdoch. Uh, let you know we're talking about it more tonight. Um, but we also have the Doomsday Bell uh, case tonight as well. So we shall see. A great, great conversation. Great comments. Appreciate it. Appreciate the support. And uh, until next time, uh, I'm Vinny Politan. Please don't forget to hug the kids.